Hello again, basketball fans. I'm Rick Kamla, and this is NBA Vault. While the Lakers and Celtics were dominating the 1980s, a hungry contender was rising up to challenge them. And in 1989, the Detroit Pistons finally claimed the NBA crown. And today we will look back at those 89 Pistons with a man who helped give the team its toughness and swagger. Former NBA power forward Rick Mahorn joins us along with our hoop historians Peter Vesey and Gail Goodrich. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun right here with the big fella in the middle. Let's get him the ball, Peter. More swagger than toughness. <laughs> more, more swagger than toughness. I hear you, Pete. I'm about to jump on Gail. Anyway. Gail's going to be the gonna, first we're one we're I'm going to jump We're not going to get him the ball. He's got to go to the glass to get See, that. You kept, you're the one that keeps saying that you're going to go to the hoop every time. You love playing against guys like me before this show. I would hurt you, Gail. <laughs> Gail, you would shoot two free throws, and then they would have to call time out and bring you over. There. No, I haven't. I haven't gotten gotten see now like you have yet. <laughs> Since you already threw me back to yeah. when I back to 1959. I don't know where I was at. 59. I wasn't even born. Gail, did you ever play with an, with an enforcer in a, in a mouth like Rick Mahorn? With an enforcer, yes. With a mouth, no. <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't talk a lot when I played. It was more of just going out there setting the tone. And no. Gail, you would have loved playing with me because you would have felt like you can beat the world. You felt like you could beat King Kong. No, you, I, I would agree with that because I did see you play. And I do know that you did bring toughness to that 89 team. There's no question about it. That was, a, that was an outstanding team. And there's a reason why you were called the bad boys. Oh, well, thank you. Now you want to get on my good right, side. Right, right. There was a reason. There was a reason. There was a reason I nicknamed you <laughs> Ricky <laughs> Mayhem. Mayhem, <laughs> yeah. That's where the mayhem came from. How appropriate. I love that. And he is Ricky Mayhem. And we're going to hear more from him in just a little bit. But first, back in 1988, the Pistons were up three games to two in the finals against my Lakers at the time. But Isaiah Thomas sprained his ankle in game six. And despite a valiant effort by Zeke, Detroit ended up losing the series. And so they entered 1989 with a lot to prove. If I wouldn't have got hurt, I think we would have beat them. No, I know we would have beat them. We were a better team than they were. And they knew it, we knew it, and I think the whole world knew it. We felt like we won that series. Yeah, we could be satisfied. We played them tough, went to seven games, they went to the wire. Yeah, most teams would be satisfied with that, but not us. We knew after Game 7 in L.A., at the Forum, sitting in the shower, we all knew we were ready to be world champions. One of the things we talked about in the locker room after, everybody make sure you stay in shape, be ready for training camp, come to training camp in game shape, because we knew we were there. Bring it up, bring it up, bring it, bring it, bring it. Oh, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Before the season started, we were winning the championship. Every practice uh, was, was about winning the championship. Every film session was about winning the championship. Every thought that you had was about winning the championship. You couldn't be playing to make the all-star team. You couldn't be playing to, to be the league leader in rebounds or the, the best assist guy. You were either with us or against us. And if you were a teammate, you were in it for the sole purpose of winning the championship and nothing else, or you were out. He had that mentality, and that permeated the rest of the team. In fact, when players would come onto the Pistons, there was this famous sit-down between Lambeer and, and, and Thomas and the new player. Whenever it was, everyone else would clear out, and it would just be the three of them, and they would say, now look, this is what it's like to be a Detroit Piston, all right? Forget everything else that you learned. This is how it works around here. Isaiah did that, Lambeer followed, and they really were sort of the Don and the uh, consigliere of, of the Pistons. You would have to go through some sort of emotional and physical gauntlet with, with, with the Pistons. And if you were able to, to go through the gauntlet, you stayed, you were embraced. Every step of the way on their road to success, they learned something. They learned that they needed more experienced players. Then they learned that they needed more speed. Then they learned that they needed a different kind of low post score. Then they learned that we have to step up our defensive pressure a certain way. Every step of the way, they figured things out. Daly was great because he didn't want to have anything to do with the players after the game was done. It was all, you get your jobs done, you'll make your money, we'll all be happy. Let's go, guys, let's go. Help each other, help each other. No one guy's 
Let's go. Everybody's gonna get rewarded if we win a championship. You're gonna get your new contract. You're gonna get your. You're gonna get your endorsement. He would motivate them by saying, "You like your endorsement contract? You think that that's a good thing? You think they're gonna give you that if you don't win a championship? They're gonna give it to somebody else who wins a championship. I mean, that would be his motivation." We're in a position to win this game. We play extra games, right? Chuck, and I can't emphasize this enough. He let us grow as people, as personalities, and also as a team. He come hard up here, run him off the pick, Billy Lobby. Serious intensity going on right there, and those Pistons were a team on a mission. And Rick, I want to talk about Chuck Daly and how he helped you guys bridge that tough loss in the '88 Finals to go on all the way and winning it in '89. How great of a coach was Daly? Oh, Chuck was one of the best. I mean, a lot of the coaches, a lot of my coaching technique and Bill Lambert's coaching technique come from Chuck Daly. We put he put the responsibility on us as players and each individual individuals to police ourselves. And I thought Chuck was just a great guy at motivating guys to get better but I want to ask you about we, we make a big deal about Zeke getting hurt in that game rightfully so mm -hmm. but you were also injured in that game which nobody ever talks about correct I had a ruptured disc I started um, that was it? experience experiencing <laughs> back problems you know all of a sudden I couldn't even feel my leg every really? time every day it was a chore to feel my leg and now you know how your opponents oh felt gosh. playing against you yeah so there was yeah. a lot of numbness going on but I tell you it was it was it was it was frustrating for me being a player saying that we had a team that was capable of winning that championship and with Isaiah getting hurt as well now you got two of your starters just not really playing and all of a sudden these guys are really picking it up the year before you know you you had the problem with Isaiah throwing that ball away in against the Celtics I mean you guys in two straight years had things going right with you with that pass and with Isaiah with uh, Vinnie Johnson and Dantley banging heads in game seven had things not those not happen. You could have won four titles in a row. Yeah. So talk about that pass. I'll tell you, you know, at that, that particular time in game five, you know, we, we make the stop. They turn the ball over, and I'm getting ready to ask Chuck, does he want to run a timeout? I saw Chuck going, saying timeout. I turn around, and the ball is being inbounded by Isaiah. And but were you supposed to inbound? I was supposed to inbound to the guys like Isaiah and Joe Dumars, or we were going to run a play right. to move the ball up to advance the ball so you don't have it in the backcourt to make those make those kind of mistakes. And we made those mistakes, and it was, it was a learning process. The headbutt of uh, Isaiah, uh, not Isaiah, but Vinny Johnson and Adrian Dantley, that just, it went like, wow. Go for what a loose ball, ball loose game. Ball. And that's the first time you say, hey, AD, what you doing diving for a ball? That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, we're having a good time. We're living the glory days of the Detroit Pistons with Rick Moore, Peter Vesey and Gail Goodrich. And the good news is we have three more segments coming up on that very topic. We got to take a quick time out. We're coming back with a look at the leader of that Piston team, Hall of Fame point guard, Zeke. You know, once Isaiah gets into his rhythm, he's unstoppable. Boy, he put on a one-man show. Way down to the floor. Comes in the lane. Ten-footers on the way. He's awesome, baby! Oh, my goodness. He was incredible. Isaiah gets by Magic. He's in the air. 18-foot jumper. Good! Oh, what a shot! If he'd have been five inches taller, he might have been the greatest player that ever played the game. Isaiah in the lane. Flying left-hand scoop. He hit it off the window. 26 you seconds. You take what it is that you're doing out on the court and make a guy in the 15th row feel what you're doing. That's when you got something special. Here's Isaiah. Let's see what we got. All the way up. Go! The best part of the game was the game. Ain't nothing like being in beside those four lines and doing your thing. Ain't nothing like it. Nothing. And there's nothing like Isaiah Thomas, one of the greatest point guards of all time, led the Detroit Pistons to back-to-back -back chips, and was really the man who defined those Piston teams as both a player and a leader. And Rick, your former teammate, talk about the qualities that made Isaiah Thomas great. And do you agree with Daly when he says five inches uh, might have equaled the greatest player of all time for, you know, for Thomas? You know, people are hyped for a reason. And at his height, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, he was just dominant. Even at, even at his height at that time, you figure if you could stretch him about five more inches like Chuck said 
I don't know. I mean, you got the, you got that guy number 23 was hovering around, and then you got the improvement of everybody else. But at that time, he played like he was six foot five, six six, and and could take over a game at any time. And I remember reading an article in Sports Illustrated where it's, he said, he, and it was a quote, he can score 50 points every night if he wanted hmm. to. I think that was in the Post. Oh, it <laughs> could have been in the Post a little bit, but I know it was in that side, and I was with the Bullets at that time, and I said, this guy said he can score 50 points every night. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to see when this guy was going to do it, but I saw it, and I mean, I saw it every day. I mean, practice, we made ourselves better by practicing against each other because we wanted minutes, and when you want minutes and you want to play and you be on the court, just like Chuck said, you'll get all the promotions, you'll get all those um, endorsements. That's what made us better because we wanted each other's time. And did he carry a little chip on his shoulder because of all the accolades given to the birds and the magics? Did that kind of tick him off a little bit? Did that drive him? Let me, let me answer that. He had a manhole cover on him. You know? <laughs> chip. Chip. I mean, every time him and, um, him, and, uh, him, and, him and Magic were so, you know, they were close friends, you know, playing, uh, playing ball against each other. But I'm going to just tell you, this guy had, he just had just like the, biggest chip on his shoulder like he wanted to prove to the world and that's when we all em 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 embraced that and said you know they don't want the bad boys to win anything so we went out there and we took what we wanted you know it's like we're gonna take your gym we're gonna beat you here we're gonna look at your people in the crowd and they gonna <laughs> boo us but yeah. that's our that's our gym this is our gym yeah. tonight he, he was just a tremendous competitor I mean uh, and I think that in watching him play you get the, got the feeling that there wasn't anything that he wanted to do that he couldn't do on basketball. And, and that's the best thing about playing with somebody that's, that's a competitor. And with him leading by example, getting to practice early, leaving late, working on his game, that made everybody else accountable. And, you know, when you got that kind of person say, if he's doing it, I better get my butt up there and do it too. Now, it, when the game got tight at the, at the, at the end of the ball game, he wanted the ball, right? I mean, yes. he, 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 he's a lot like Jerry West, I mean, in terms of a, of a competitor. I mean, you put the ball in his hands and said, either score or get it to someone, you know, do, do, finish the job, mm -hmm. and, he, and he'd do it. And he did that, and he did that on a regular basis. It was like, we'll get in the huddle, and it's the last second shot, and they saw, you saw it on the film against Atlanta. He's like, just give me the ball. We knew how to execute, and that's what separated us from a lot of teams. You could stop us on the first initial thrust, the second or third, but our fifth option was even better than our first option because teams don't want to play defense. So we executed to the point we made the game look ugly, but we made the game look pretty when we won. When we won. Well, Isaiah finished the job. Rick, you and the Pistons did a couple of times, and we're coming back to finish the job with two more segments. We dip back into the vault for the 1989 Finals when the Pistons finally reached the top of the NBA mountain. Keep it here. It's the NBA Vault. After their heartbreaking loss to the Lakers in the 1988 Finals, the Pistons would have their chance for revenge the very next season in a rematch against L.A. Now, they had already toppled the reigning powerhouse in the Eastern Conference, the Boston Celtics, and the Pistons learned some lessons from the Celtics, and the words of Kevin McHale did make a strong impression on Isaiah Thomas. Kevin said something to me last year walking off the court when we beat Boston. He said, don't be happy just to be there. You know, go and win it. I, I heard what he said, I, I listened, and I understood, but I really didn't understand until now that we're back in it again. I understand now. Well, man, there's just a bunch of tall guys running around if you don't have a program. The Pistons and Lakers will play for the global crowd of basketball. I never felt like we weren't going to win. Give me room! Give me room! I'm going high, so let it get up in the air! Detroit has just dominated this final period. I 
remember I sat next to Pat Riley uh, after game two, and I just got seated next to him on an airplane. He was flying back without the rest of his team. And he was looking over the charge of the game, and he was looking over what the Pistons were doing defensively to him. And finally, he just let out the side. And he shook his head, and I said, what? He goes, we can't win. Newmars has it outside, takes it baseline right, turns and guns. He got it! He's been just incredible. To Rivers, he'll try a triple left corner, blocked by Dumars, he saved it! For me, it was a magical time, magical time. It was almost like uh, the series took place as a dream. Everything that could have went right in our favor did. I remember the night before game four, me and a friend of mine who lives in L.A., we went out to uh, watch the Dodgers play Cincinnati, had a hot dog, watched about seven or eight in his baseball game. Got up and I told my friend, well, Let's get out of here. I got a championship going tomorrow. Hey, you got a championship! Grab the trophy! Here come the Pistons. The Pistons are going to win the world title. 28 seconds away, Big Ben. When we got to the title game, it was like the championship was built for us. It wasn't built for anybody else. The Pistons are the basketball champions of the world! Everything that you had worked for, everything that you had gone through as a team, it was like you were spent, and it was just like everything was beautiful, everything was wonderful. The smell was great, the champagne tasted good, the colors was awesome. I mean, you know, I think I said it was, it was like heaven. It feels like cool. heaven. so relieved. I just sat in a chair outside the block and it was like the year went out of the balloon. I was just, I was totally exhausted. Everybody in Detroit be coming home and having a party. Crazy, crazy party. And the party lasted until about five or six o'clock in the morning and then the tennis ride and got on the plane going back to Detroit with his uniform still on. Let the party begin in no time. Serious party going on there. I think it's still going on for Rick. Now, the Pistons <laughs> swept the Lakers in four straight to win their first ever NBA championship. And Joe Dumars was named Finals MVP. Now, we got to mention a couple of things. Magic Johnson gets hurt in that series. Byron Scott gets hurt before that series began. Not to take anything away from you guys, obviously, uh, but I want you to tell us uh, uh, Joe Dumars' Hall of Fame career, obviously. Um, have you ever seen him better than in that Finals? I'll tell you, he was spectacular. Like he said, everything that went right that night. It happened, everything for the Pistons, and it was like, okay, we can go to the basket. We were just playing tremendous basketball. We were not going to be denied what we were destined to get, and that was that championship. The core guys deserve their accolades, of course, but James Edwards, as we saw a couple <laughs> times in that, I mean, blocking Kareem's uh, shot, dunking in another instance. Talk about James a little bit. I'm going to tell you, Buddha was just, you know, one, he's still one of my best friends, him and Vinnie Johnson and Lambeer. But Buddha came off that bench and was so strong. You were a real team. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you had 10 guys that really played uh, collectively. You all had different roles, mm -hmm. and you had tremendous amount of balance. I mean, you look at the team, you had, what, six guys, almost seven guys in double figures. Yes, and we all sacrificed, and that's what it is. You sacrifice for the team. It wasn't about the name on the back. It was about the name on the front. Boy, and when you said the Pistons. I haven't heard that cliche in oh, a man, while. That's a good one, man. But it's all about it. That's what, you know, that's a misconception of most of the athletes today. Right now, they think they got, it's, it's, on, yeah. it's, it's them on the front, and it's about them in the back, too. Yeah. Well, you were the swashbucklers yeah. of the NBA at your time. There's no doubt about that. And we've got one more. I don't know. I, I was going to call a little. I don't know if it's a little segment. We'll just have to come back and see how long it goes. We've got more on the Pistons, including the man who opponents love to hate, one of the all-time villains in the NBA, Bill Lambeer, when the vault continues. Well, I wasn't a dirty player. No one ever got hurt. I'm a hard-nosed player. I may be a chippy player, but uh, no one ever got hurt. You always knew at the end of the day, if you were in the Fato, uh, Lambeer would be in there with you. I play for my team only, and I play very hard, and I never go away. I'm always in your face. 
my greatest strength was the mental aspect of the game, wearing people down and outthinking them and outcompeting them. And once you have somebody mentally intimidated, you have them beat. Come on, get him! Get him! They had a guy that could make 20-foot jump shots, make three-pointers, uh, a very good post defender. And uh, I don't think Detroit wins it without Bill Lambeer. Lambeer is a Hall of Famer. It doesn't look like it. You wouldn't think of him as being a Hall of Famer, but this man could rebound, and he knocked you down, walk on you. But, but the man was talented. I was a winner. I played to win, and I hated losing. I made it my business to make sure that uh, I came every night, every game, every practice with that attitude, and I think it carried on. I get a lot of credit for, for doing a lot of things in Detroit, but, uh, you know, without Lambeer, none of it would have happened. How'd I do? <laughs> you did great, Bill. And Bill Lambeer <laughs> relished playing the role of the villain. He also brought a lot to the table for those Piston teams, including defense, rebounding, and he was also a rare big man for the time who could step out and shoot that three. And, Rick, you and Bill were a bruising tag team for the Pistons. Give us your take on Lambeer and how he would get the initial foul. We'd hear the tweet. And then it was almost like an and one uh, uh, follow-up foul from you. Oh, gosh. It, that, that was the best part. You know, all of a sudden, Dominique Wilkins will go to the basket, and you hear the whistle. Foul on four. By the time that whistle would blow, you know, it was a free foul. It was a free hit. And you know back then, you, hey, I'm going to get him, too. So uh, might as well give a double foul. But I tell you, I love playing with him. Rick. Your take on the uh, Adrian Dantley uh, trade that, that uh, for, for uh, Mark Aguirre, for Mark Aguirre mm -hmm. that, that led to the championship, what was your take? Well, on you know, the take at that time, you know, you got uh, uh, inspiring Dennis Rodman, and then you also had A.D., who was the guy that, you know, get the ball on the post, and, and he made great decisions and all that. I guess at that time they wanted to make it where a guy can get more ball movement with Mark Aguirre. You can stretch out the defense. And, you know, A.D., at that time, it hurt us as players. We was like, boy, A.D., AD this is the teacher. You can't get rid of the teacher. But uh, as, as you realize, this is business. And that trade made us from we were in second place in the Central Division, and next thing you know, we, went, we ripped off like 30 games that were 20 eight and three and we ended up overcoming Cleveland and having the best record in the league and that helped us out a lot. It was a lot like the trade or not unlike the trade uh, in 2004 midseason that brought Rasheed Wallace to the Pistons helped them win it and uh, I, I want to ask you this would the Pistons have won the 89 championship without that trade and Rick then ultimately how did it feel to win that championship? I'll tell you don't know what would have happened but I thought we would have won the championship if Isaiah didn't get hurt and then also I'm not and with me being hurt but the cards weren't right and I guess it was right in 89 I'll tell you it was a sweet victory it felt great I mean euphoric just like like Isaiah said you're in heaven and you don't. You never want to come out of that. So each year you want to strive to get championships. Rick, uh, it's been a pleasure, obviously, uh, reliving the glory days of the Detroit Pistons with you. Obviously, you're a colleague of ours here on NBA TV. We're having a blast with you around, and it's good to have you on the vault. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. It's our pleasure. Rick Mahorn, Gail Goodrich, Peter Vesey, and uh, as always, thanks to you for watching here on NBA Vault. I'm Rick Campbell for our crew here at NBA TV, saying we'll see you next time.